Riding for Maidenhead District Cycling Club, John Woodburn. In 1961, a young man called John Woodburn won the National 25 Mile Time Trial Cup. Forty years later, he was still winning time trial awards, like the RTTC Veterans Best All-Rounder, presented by another cycling legend, Eddie Merckx. In this interview, cycling historian John Pinkerton starts by asking John Woodburn about his early memories. Born in Handsworth in Birmingham, weren't you? That's right, in 19... 36 in December. We won't bother to do the sums, but no. to, <laughs> yeah. obviously the 30 year old that you were riding with the other day is less than half your age. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And, and how long did you stay in Handsworth? Oh, we lived there till about, I think, the late 40s, about 49. And my father was a um, commercial artist, but he was, uh, at the outbreak of war, he was called up into the Royal Air Force and he was stationed at. Uh, Newnham Courtney, Medmanham, Benson, and I think he was at Chobham, a little grass airfield um, near um, a oh, uh, place that's been flooded. Oh, well, it was Chobham, mm -hmm. uh, between Chobham and uh, oh, just the west, uh, east of Chobham, I think. But it's still there, it's a commercial um, light aircraft, a bit like White Waltham, which is mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Maidenhead. And, um, he liked this area so much in '49, he decided to move to Woodcote, about eight, nine miles north of Reading. And it, that was the time I only had to sit up. And he was a bit anti dropped handlebars. Can you tell me about your earliest memories of cycling and the, the sort of bikes that you had? But when I was a child in the middle, of, when we were in Birmingham, I used to, I'd, I had a three wheeler when I was very little. Somebody was asked me only the other day what was my m longest memory and I think it was riding my three-wheeler I think it had a fixed wheel because I remember I used to go around corners on two wheels and the other wheel used to keep because <laughs> I was still pedaling furiously <laughs> and always falling off it if I remember I then graduated still in, in Hansworth onto some it was as you know just after the war it would have been very difficult to get quality bicycles and in this I have one long memory that the rear brake was a continuous um, rod which just was bent round underneath mm -hmm. the bottom bracket and it was virtually impossible to pull the back brake on. I had, obviously I was very not very old and I had people a bit more older and more knowledgeable and even I mean it was obvious that it wasn't it didn't have a proper linkage on it mm. but eventually when we moved um, to Woodcote I had a better sit up big bike and with a little I always remember my pride and joy was a, a Lucas cyclometer, which used to annoy me because going downhill, the striker would get, it would sort of uh, hit the end of the star yeah. and bend back and all the rest of it. So I just had to go downhill slow, which was a bit annoying. And I used to log religiously my daily mileages, which would have been about three or four miles a day, but I think it was a start. That's and right. then uh, eventually I did get a dropped handlebar bike for some reason, I don't know, I just being a bloody minded. My old man was very Victorian, but I, to hell with it, I managed to get one. I think it was a Norman Invader. I think I eventually had a Claude Butler. And then the school I was at, there were one or two guys there who were interested, a bit unusual, but they were interested in cycling and the head boy was into it. And uh, that was where I first got a, a sort of interest into lightweight, proper lightweight cycling. And I can remember vividly, there was a chap at school, he was a what we would now call a bit of a poser. He had a Paris Galibia, <laughs> which was one of those multicoloured things with the funny down tube and like. Uh, and we cycled to South Sea with another guy I'd known at my previous school at Woodcote. So I'd by then moved to school in Reading. And um, that was the start of it. And uh, I've sort of been spending lots of money ever since on lightweight bits and pieces because I think the interest to me in cycling isn't the pleasure of just touring, racing. It's also bikes themselves I find mm. very, they're nice to work on bikes, especially with all the modern stuff and the tools and the old days of cotter pins, thank God they've gone. Because <laughs> they were a nightmare, cotter pins. I don't know what you thought of them, but. You used to hit them with a hammer. Well, yeah. <laughs> You should knock the bottom, bottom bracket out of the tubes at the same time. But, uh, That's right. Yeah. But yeah, modern equipment, although it is, I will have to say, it is expensive, the best stuff. You don't have to have the best stuff. and I do, but 
you can still get very good transmission there and the brake levers, it's all nice stuff and it's a shame that it wasn't around when I was young but that's life isn't it? Yeah. So, the only snag is if you fall off these days, it can be a bit expensive with a £200 pair of brake levers. I'm talking about index, you yeah, know, the yeah. Ergo or STI. I get very confused all with It's the a combination of brake and gear lever, John, as I oh, understand it. Yeah, well, that would yeah, <laughs> be a better way of describing it. <laughs> John, you say that today equipment is expensive, and yet you've just told me that as a schoolboy you had a Claude Butler. Mm. Now, whether it was bought new or whether it was bought it second, hand. second hand. But even if it was new, that would have been terribly expensive. Well, I suppose it would. Um, I think the the, Claude, the first Claude Butler, if I remember, I got it off a teacher at school and I presume he would have given me a very good price on it. I remember when I was in the... Uh, when I started work, my pay was pretty low and then I joined the RAF and the pay was even worse. I was constantly in debt with the local bike shop. I think it was on an army, a, a bomber station in the RF in uh, at Bimbrook in Lincolnshire. And I can mm -hmm. remember, I think I had a permanent, but, you know, they used to keep books in the old days, didn't they? But every bike shop used to sort of have a key. That if right. you were credit worthy, you had this, <laughs> Put kept down a the book. book. I was permanently, for three years, I think I had this bike dealer money. I think I did pay him up at the end before I left. <laughs> didn't want him chasing me all the way back down to <laughs> Woodcote or wherever. But, um, yeah, I mean, I can remember that possibly the most expensive was when I first started work after I came out of the RAF was tubulars, really. I, I found the hardware, the bike side of it, because you had to have tubulars. They, and they were a total nightmare, really, because they didn't, they were always punching and too damn lazy to repair them. So you're everlasting you're buying tubular tyres, which even to this day, I still race on tubular tyres. Mm. I think they're the most responsive mm. form of, um, you know, contact with the road. I, I do, it's a godsend these days, we ride, I always ride training and pleasure ridings on 700, you know, open, what they call wide on tyres, or yeah. there's another word for them. Are the Americans, clinchers, clinchers. The Americans call them clinchers. Which yeah, but I call them uh, wide on. Yeah, which they are. And they are, they they do, they, they have made my cycling very much more economical now mm. because uh, it's so easy to repair a punch now. Can you remember what your first tubular tyres cost, how much they were? Well, and more importantly, how much you were earning? Well, you're mostly on about four pounds a week and the tyre would be something in the region, about 17 shillings and sixpence. Are we talking about, I don't know, is that... Uh, Almost a quarter. A quarter, yeah. Mm. You you translate that to modern day earnings and mm. stuff has got cheaper, I think, rather well, than I more think expensive. It, yeah, I mean, we just look at the figures rather than the actual yeah, value. I think that you are quite right there. I think, uh, I mean, okay, I've got some like um, Shimano or Campag top of the range equipment, and it does seem expensive, but and also it's how long. A, things going to last if we're talking about gear levers or chain sets it's they if you look after your stuff I mean you get years and years of mm. you, I've got loads of campag stuff for instance that I've had since the 70s and it's still I worry a little bit because the cranks have done millions and millions of revs they've had me pressing and it, campag cranks for instance they did used to break years ago, but they never they just go on and on I just still I've done a 51 minute 25 on a pair of old uh, record cranks that I've had since the 70s and I mean really oh. I shouldn't be riding them but they still you know if you I've always I've always taken a great pleasure in maintaining bikes I don't like to uh, I, apart from my work bike and I think a lot of cyclists then they have a, a work bike which you know it doesn't matter but uh, I do enjoy sort of having a nice clean well a machine that really works spot on but as you say I think cycling and also, I mean, dare we say it, there's a lot of competition um, with all the... That when they got away, got rid of retail price maintenance, it, it brought the price of equipment down, mm -hmm. which whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But as a cyclist, as a, an actual purchaser of equipment, it's made life much more... Uh, and also, of course, there's a lot more different quality equipment anyway, mm. so, which m also makes the... It's like Shimano, it's funny, some of the Shimano products undercut Campag, and yet it's, um, 
it all helps to make it cheap, as you say, mostly for the amount of money I earn. Well, I'm on a pension as well now, so I mean, I'm not too. Uh, but uh, I think cyclists have got this sort of. I think cyclists, to a degree, are always a bit tight, aren't they? They they don't like spending on bikes, but I don't mind all the good stuff. But we're always trying to look. Um, you don't sort of get. I mean, I think my. I've always spent. I've always bought all the best stuff over the years, and of course. You, I always sort of think I've wasted. So, but have I wasted money? Um, I because of all the pleasure, <coughs> and I, I commute on it, and I don't well, have to run a car. And if you if you balance <coughs> the whole thing out, I'm most probably. Wh why do I worry about you, it? You've answered your own question, mm. John. You've invested money into good equipment, but you've had a tremendous amount of pleasure out of it That's over right. your life. Yeah. And it's kept you extremely fit. Mm. I think you're lying about a pension, by the way. You're certainly not old enough to have a pension yet. Um, I believe that you had some involvement with Moulton uh, when he was starting off. That um, came about. There was a period in my life, I mean, I've worked for the post office for a long time, but I sort of was like, I didn't really have a proper job. Uh, although it seems strange now that I've been on the post office nearly 35 years, but there again I'm getting pretty ancient. So, but there was a period when I was sort of, you could say, bumming around, and uh, I wasn't really going anywhere. But there was, a, I was approached by, yeah, I better get this right, David Duffield. David Duffield, yeah. And um, I was what is known as a semi-professional. I uh, immediately after winning the national 25, I was asked by, uh, funnily enough, we mentioned retail price um, maintenance, a chap who had started a movement w which was going on with Whisker and a guy called Jack Baguli. Uh, they were sort of breaking the law by and upsetting quite a lot of people, I think, who, who were staying, because obviously it was a cartel that retail price, with all the other traders. Mm -hmm. But this chap was called, um, oh, I can't, I can't remember his name, um, but he had a shop in Finchley's now, um, shorter Rochford's. But um, I used to ride for this particular shop owner, Ted Gerrard's it was called. Uh, I rode for Ted Gerrard as an independent. And, um, but I, had a, I was approached by David Duffield to see whether I could be, I'd be seconded over to Moulton's to do a record, and Gerrard was okay about that. And I, I think it was in 62, there was an arrangement, I would go down on a Monday and um, train on the bicycle and test it and in fact did time trials and initially we were going to do a time trial attempt with a cow but it was decided that people, it's funny really, doing that is Boardman record, we've now got this one hour athletes record on the track as opposed to you can have anything goes situation and they they had the foresight to realise that people just say, oh, it wasn't the bike, it would be the cow. Mm. So, and it's a bit like Borden's New Hour record. Mm. People say, well, it's the bike, not the rider. So it's nothing new in cycling, as we say. Mm. And uh, so the, the cow was, um, we did away with that. I nearly came close to killing it. I think I solved, nearly solved the problem anyway, because we had a trial one morning on the Bridgewater Flats. And in order to get maximum speed, you had to get your head below the cowl. But it had a little purse, like on a motorcycle fair, and it had a bit of clear perspex. And, but the trouble is, it was so misty, it kept misty, I couldn't see. So every now I was looking over the top and then dropping down. What I didn't realise, there was a woman gently cycling, and I nearly <laughs> hit her up the backside. And I think that would have definitely, the cow would have shattered anyway. But I think it might have been a bit of bad publicity for Alex. So fortunately, I didn't hit the lady. But um, I remember I did, did a good time because I think Alex very kindly paid for quite a meal. It's a very smart place for lunch. I think it was one of the top ten restaurants in the Sunday Times. Or so. <laughs> so published the fact, so we thought we'd go there. Yeah. But um, in the end, it was decided decided we would go for um, Cardiff, London, just to, on without cow and just a straightforward ride on that. And that was plagued with, it, the main problem was no wind. We tried to do it during cycle show week, which was then in, at Earl's Court, and that would have been really good. But the wind just didn't blow. And eventually, I think I may be still the only person to have broken a road record in December. I managed to break it 
I think in mid-December in 62, was that? 62, I think. Yeah. And um, I did sort of, I think that was more or less the end of it. I, I not, for various reasons, I think I, there was one more attempt. I was going to do London, York. Mm. But unfortunately, I was very annoyed about it. I had a terribly bad cough. And I always remember on the Monday, uh, the attempt would have been on the Sunday, on the Monday there was a, a picture of a, a, a railway train and it had all these cars and they'd all been blown off the road. And I, I, was, I was absolutely livid because I think I almost certainly would have got it. But you can't, mm. you're not sure. I mean, the wind direction might not have been quite right. But, uh, and that, that more or less was the end of my involvement with Alex. But it was a very, it gave me quite a lot of publicity. Um, in a, you know, I, I remember somebody saying that they'd been into Australia house and um, they'd actually sort of seen my name in this Australian paper, you know, you think, oh, it's sort of gone right round the oh, world. Yeah. world. And network. at the time, I mean, I was only really national 25 mile champion, I, did, I didn't think, but it, and also there was, always remember the Daily Express did a thing called Photo News, I think it was, and it was a whole, that was when it was a big like the Telegraph, it's a much smaller paper now. There was one whole page of pictures of that ride, and I think there was one of me holding the bike, and pictures of Alex, of course, mm. Mm. and lots of the bike, and but a few of me. And it was, I did get a lot of publicity for my involvement with Alex. I'm not sure whether this ought to go into this, but whether Alex would, I don't think he would mind really. Let's hope he won't. But I think I've told Tony about this. But when I was doing the training rides. I, I was allowed to have an expense account lunch and like all cyclists I used to think to hell with the bloody ride this afternoon I'm going to have a, a black because I used to go a potter in the morning go for the lunch and then they had these trials with the cowl and I was timed every half mile and it was a bit too well it was a nightmare really because to be honest Alex was expecting an improvement they would do mods and, and I, obviously I would get a, and I was getting a better feel for the whole thing because it was it was difficult. The suspension did take a little bit of getting used to because it's, as you know, I'm so used to riding on a, a stiff mm. and just tyres pumped up to about 100 psi plus. And uh, but the great tragedy was that I was talking to the head waiter in the restaurant. I'd not been going in there, but the food was pretty good. And I just mentioned, I said, "Where where do you come from?" He said, "Spain." So I said, "Oh." The great rider at the time was a chap called Federico Bahamontes, who'd won the Tour de France. And that sort of gave me an automatic sort of pass to have everything I needed to eat. He was really friendly and it was, you know, soup, um, fish, meat course, as many sweets as I could eat and <laughs> as many coffees. And then, of course, I then had to ride the, uh, the bike, which... <laughs> I don't, well, at least I had plenty of calories in the system, I can say that. Unfortunately, time trialling's flat. I mean, that, <laughs> if it had been hilly, it might have, uh, somebody might have started asking questions. But he didn't, I don't think it went on the expense account. I think it was, I'd like to think he only got charged for a, a sort of, you know, <laughs> meat and two veg. But um, it was a good period. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I sort of was a naughty boy and I did, did run the bike down once, but I felt, from my point of view, I've always been interested in bikes, and I felt the great problem with the Molten in those days, it was very heavy, and the tyres could have been more refined. They were, I think, Dunlop number no. fives, and the rims were solid, and I think there could have been a lot of refinements made to it. And what I was unhappy, and I know it did cause problems, and I think the mechanic at the time, I think his name was Tommy Crowther, Crowther, he used, mm -hmm. was formerly of Mercy in Cycles, he <coughs> knew I had a problem on the front suspension, and he in fact reduced the rubber, the comp it compressed it by 50%, and it made the front much stiffer. It was still there, but it wasn't so, mm. it was very bad, I didn't like it, how it went, moved up and down on the front. Mm. Didn't mind it on the back, I felt the back, it, that was acceptable to me, but not on the front. But I think if the front suspension had been taken out with just the, the, the trailing rear arm sort of on that block, I felt that was all right. It was, it did seem good that. From what you've said, John, we're absolutely sure now that on your Cardiff to London ride, the suspension on the Moulton 
wasn't locked up, it was working properly? No, no, that was exactly as it was. Nothing, it was absolutely standard. I mean, I don't, maybe I've not covered this, but what happened was when I, Tommy Crover, he compressed the front suspension mm -hmm. on the front, and what happened, like a bloody idiot, I decided to ride it down from the workshop area towards the entrance to the hall, and who should, I mean, it was purely bad luck. He mostly found out anyway, but... He, Alex was walking the opposite way, and he was look. He obviously looked at the bellows. I, would, I think that's the correct word. Mm. And he noticed they were not operating, or very not not as they should. John, right, up, he took it apart, and that's when he was, he found out. But then <laughs> Crowder nearly lost his job. But now on Cardiff London, the bicycle was exactly as Alex wanted it to be, and mm. I didn't have any. I mean. I was paid to do, I think it was a pound a mile or something to do it, which was quite good money in those days. I mean, it, well, if I could have done that every day, I'd be a millionaire. But it, um, the bike was standard. There was mm. nothing modified on it at all. The, you know, there's the solid rims, the Dunlop number no. 5 tyres. And, the, uh, and I had a bet, I forget what size the chain was, 60 plus chain ring with about an 11 sprocket on a four-speed close sternly archer, so I had four gears, mm -hmm. and I found the gearing quite okay. Uh -huh. I was surprised with the hub gear, I'd never raced one before, first time ever, but I, during the whole period I was on four-speed close, and I found the gears quite, you know, although it was only four gears. Well, it's funny in those days, because time trial, you only used about five or six gears anyway, single chain ring and sort of 13, 14, I think when I won the National I was 14 up, five-speed sprocket so it's funny really thinking in this modern day and age you're there I'm telling you I've got a bike with 18 gears I used to time trial on five gears mm. only five times but on the road I would have we would have had access to 10 gears I suppose it would have been like mm. the traditional thing was 48 52 and 14 16 18 five on the back usually two up on the back you've taken this quite formidable record Cardiff to London on what people would call a Mickey Mouse bike, yeah. and they did call it a Mickey Mouse bike. Was that the sort of end of your association with Moulton, or did you stay with him for a time? I think more or less it was the end, because I think he then took on Vic Nicholson, and there was an, a rep, he employed a rep called Alan somebody, I can't remember his name. Waterwasser? <laughs> no, Alan Perkins, and he was a, quite a good roadman. And, and there were other riders as well, and um, I think they, they came on the scene and mm -hmm. that was the end of my involvement. Because I, as I understood it, the whole idea that I was, it was, I was on, under, well, sort of, I mean, it was a bit Mickey Mouse, but because I, I was never all that happy with the semi, I was what was known as semi-professional, but the money wasn't, and Ted Gerrard got into serious difficulties, he was a bit of a rogue and he ended up in prison. Um, and I eventually went to another, uh, I might have been, I think I went to Alan Shorter but, or Ken Ryle, I can't remember. I wasn't all that happy with the independent scene and in fact I wanted to get out of it. There was very little money to be made. I mean, if Moulton had said, right, do road records week in, week out, especially with the money I was getting, then I would, have mo I would have possibly just gone and ridden for Moulton full time. Mm. I was a little bit worried if, if he'd have said, if he, we could have had a, t a record breaking program and he'd been willing, but I think he only wanted one record. I, there was the talk then of Car London York, but he didn't want, I don't think he was interested in one record after another, or because um, maybe he didn't want to spend money on uh, just on that one thing. It maybe didn't appeal to him just breaking records. But I think if he, then maybe we could have done business or. Mm. what you like but I think we drifted apart after the record because I, as I understood it that's that was the, the that was the one it. and that was that but, and then others came along you had people like, like Vic Nicholson was local and he had this rep um, Alan Perkins and one or two others and they took over from me and uh, mm. that was but I, there was talk having said that he did ask me to do Cardiff London so not quite London York which mm -hmm. is another, and that was the following year so I think they did have ideas on just one more record mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I was with 
Gerard then, but um, and I agreed to that. But in fact, I was ill, and uh, it was just it was a tragedy because I had this very bad cough, and I knew I just couldn't do it. And uh, but um, and the only real contact he invited us down about uh, oh six or seven years. Oh no, it was about seven or eight years ago. He invited my partner and myself down to try the new bicycle, and I think. Uh, and my partner went with Alex and he showed her, because she always went in this grand vista of the, uh, looking from the hall across to the trees and mm. Bradford and stuff. And um, we stayed for lunch. But it was classic um, Alex, I think, by the time we'd uh, had lunch, that was it. He, uh, we were ushered out and he went on to whatever, mm. whatever else he'd got planned oh, for the his, day. His time's very much... But I do remember it was quite interesting I don't know if you know that classic shot of uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel with his top hat on and his little cheroot or whatever, leaning up against the Great Eastern, I think. And I said to Alex, I said, I hope you don't mind me asking this, uh, Alex, but why have you got that picture there? You know, I thought he'd just say, oh, because he was a fine, one of Britain's greatest ever engineers. And he said, oh, my great great grandfather was a, a close friend of uh, Brunel. <laughs> it's hiding a stain on the wallpaper. Well, yeah, it's just sort of, uh, <laughs> what can you say? And that's why I suppose you could say with Alex, to sort of, to try to say that the bicycle had problem, or, you know, I wasn't totally happy with it, maybe wasn't a good idea. Mm. And yet, say, with you, if you design the bike, I think, because you, I'm sure you'd be more, mostly more, you, I think you would consider my, what I've said, or even if you didn't want it to happen, you would have been more sympathetic to mm. my request. But, I mean, Alex was, um, I think Tony would agree. I mean, he's, he's as we've just already spoken about, he is very, uh, like a very clever man. Mm. And clever people aren't, you know, the bo human beings are all dictated by your brain, aren't they? And if your brain's thinking about lots of other things much more beyond what we're capable of, us mere mortals. But we all think we're clever, don't we? But I mean, Alex, obviously, with suspension, it, there's a lot of, because I remember when we went down with my partner, he, we'd only been there five minutes and we had coffee and then we're in the drawing office and he went into the uh, finer arts of, um, oh, what's it, understeer and oversteer. Well, that is, that is a highly complex subject, isn't it? Mm. Oversteer and oversteer, especially to a woman. I mean, I don't even understand it. I don't even know whether my cars, every car I've ever owned, I couldn't tell you whether they oversteer or understeer because <laughs> I never drive that far. <laughs> but uh, do you know if your car oversteers or understeers? I, I haven't got a car. Oh, you haven't? Do you understand oversteer or understeer? <laughs> Only very vaguely. Yeah, but it's a very complex, and he started yeah. straight into that. I mean, oh my God, you know. Okay, didn't go on for too long, but long enough. <laughs> I think I should be going home in a minute. <laughs> Tell us about some of the records. I always regard my best road record, that is just me on a bicycle, is um, only it's, it was on a road just down the road. You may have come along a little bit of it this morning. And that was um, Bath and Back. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that, because I think 211 miles is far enough for any man, in my opinion, especially if you're an amateur and you're, you're sort of still, if you go to work all day long, um, then I think 211 miles, especially, uh, from my point of view, is a good record for me because the first 50 miles, the first 100 is fairly flat, and the second 100 is, plus the, uh, the 11 miles, is, is pretty rolling. You know, it's split in two halves, from Newbury to London and back's flat, and then from Newbury to Bath is quite rolling. And uh, the reason I was very pleased to get that record is held by Les West, and he was former I think he finished second in the World Professional Road Race and fourth in the World Amateur Road Race. And I think it's whose record you've beaten is possibly the most important thing with any type mm. of bike ride who's gone before. Now can you tell us about your end-to-end -end rides because I know that there's more than one. Well, I was ill on the first attempt. That's right. And um, I was still persuaded to start, I think, really I shouldn't have, I knew in my own mind I shouldn't have, but I started and I 
managed to get as far as um, Blair Rattle, but it was decided by then it was a lost cause. I wasn't going to pick up, and um, I had a virus, and I was told by a doctor um, two days before I actually started that I needed a month's rest to clear the virus out of my system. But anyway, I started, and uh, that was uh, the only consolation that year. I, Two or three weeks later, I entered the National 24 and I won that, so at least there was something to show for my long distance um, plans. And it also would be something to uh, be in the pot for a second attempt. Um, the first attempt, I did have time off work divided. Jack Fletcher by, very kindly paid for me or made up my wages, but the following year I couldn't get time off. and. Uh, so therefore it was a real amateur. He wanted me, the first time, as, as it was held by a pro, he wanted me to enjoy the conditions of a pro. But um, So really you could say the next year when I got the record I was an amateur because I was in fact worth an average of, well I was going in, shall we say, <laughs> uh, 40 hours a week. And um, the attempt was successful. Um, started off in pouring, well first half hour to Penzance was okay, poured with rain for the next two hours. I had visions, I don't know if you get that feeling when you sit in a bath too long, I thought your hands all go wrinkly and I thought if it rains like it is, it was like it was earlier today. And fortunately you got on to uh, the other side of Bodmin and it cleared. And then there was a massive traffic jam, I think it was Friday the August, Friday the 13th, 1982, and all the traffic that particular morning decided to pack up bags and go home, because it was absolutely terrible weather, rather than go home on Saturday. So that created a terrific um, tailback of traffic at Oakhampton, because there wasn't the Oakhampton bypass, and that was pretty... I got very worried there, because I realised it's all the best plans can become disaster. I didn't carry a pump or a spare, and the following car was held up and it took the following car about 10 or 15 miles and I was frightened. I thought it could be a total disaster because if I'd had a puncher and lost, say, any time lost on that record, it's, gonna, it's horrendous because you get that feeling you could lose the record by seconds at mm. the other end. And in fact, I did go ride backwards along the course to a motorcyclist to see if they could get my wheels, because I've envisioned this jam was for two or three miles, get some wheels and bring them up to me just and follow me until the car got up to me, but they in fact broken down, so I lost, I did lose time there, and when you consider I lost 50, the record by 58 seconds, but it's the way things go. The car eventually came up and from there on it was a more or less trouble free ride. Um, I think the big godsend, godsend for me was in Scotland it gets colder and I, what worried me about if it was very very hot like on carpets attempt and in fact it was quite cool I don't think I had freak conditions but I think I had average conditions for the the trip so it was there was occasions when I watched like a chimney with smoke in Scotland the wind the smoke going the wrong way and I thought oh here we go <laughs> here you comes know, I couldn't stand it I know rider can cope with a head a really strong right. headwind but uh, I think by and large it, it was um, uh, the conditions were average and uh, I did it and I was very relieved it was a it was it's very stressful getting involved in Lands and John mm. Groves so, as you know Longland and another guy in the get his name in the lakes were due to go this year neither of them have gone maybe they realize that saying you'll do lands and john groats is uh, there's so much so much involvement mm. it's also getting help and the, logi the logistics going getting the weather forecast right for something when when you get to john and growth there's something like you're looking at three, four, maybe five days weather forecasting, and you know what English weather's like, it's not that predictable. Mm. Mm. I think modern weather forecasting is pretty good, but mm. you're never quite sure what's going to happen. I think the reason I did Land's End John O'Groats wasn't the fact that I'd ridden, say, 24 hours. I mean, to me, if you, when you talk about Land's End John O'Groats, first of all, you ride 100. Well, 100 can be pretty hard, especially I've always found after 60 miles, it, as you know, your legs ache and your back aches, and from, say, 60 miles to um, 90 miles, you think you never make it, and then the last 10 miles maybe is not so bad. And then you ride 12 hours, and then that's like riding 300s. 
and then you ride 24 and that's like riding 312s because of the pain and the the fatigue factor and then end to end is something I don't know how to describe the end to end I mean the last sort of 100 miles I'm sort of out of the saddle but these are sort of it's a sort of self-inflicted sort of torture but I think really when you come to really tough things and I I think we've all seen it on television is the Tour de France but I was I've never ridden the Tour de France but I think I've ridden something quite fairly similar and that was the peace race mm. which is a I think it's still held, but it was, it, it, it was really in its, um, the best period I think was when Ian Steele won it in about 1950s, when I first started, because I can remember seeing him it, uh, on the Viking stand, and I think that is a very tough uh, stage race behind the Iron Curtain, and I think I went there just about the right time, I think the Iron Curtain was about 1961, wasn't it? when that was put up. I can't remember, but mm -hmm. I went there in 63. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you had the real sort of feel for being behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, that was definitely one of the uh, horrendous races to me. I mean, it was absolutely flat out every day. You've got the Russians, the Poles, the East Germans. And uh, although I'd done a reasonable amount of road racing, I wasn't really prepared for that sort of scenario. But um, I finished 14th out of I think there's 121 riders, so I think, and the rest of the English riders, they were, they just really went up to it, and so I was riding most of the time on my own, and uh, not every day. I can't remember exactly what happens on some days, but it, you you were really I was on my own against the Russians and the Poles and the mm. East Germans, and they could have been doped. I'm not I'm not I wouldn't like to say too much on that, but I've, I've never taken any dope of any form, I've never believed in it, I couldn't, I've never seen that. I think I said at the outset, I ride a bike because I enjoy cycling and I like to think you can do it on just good, you know, decent food and that's it. Mm. Because I think most people would agree, it is very worrying what's been happening, especially recently in the, this, um, with the blood and the fact, you know, they get is it hemocrit, the level of the blood gets so sticky that you can sort of, when they finish race, they have to sort of dilute the blood down, otherwise they, they can die of a heart attack. I mean, is it, is it sport anymore? But Not I, money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, I mean, if the money had been there, I mean, like with Moulton, or maybe you do consider these things, because like the job I'm doing now, I mean, it, it's everybody wants to leave because it's a factory environment. It's noisy, it's filthy, it's dusty. Um, is there any, you could say, is there any difference between being in a filthy environment and, and just doping yourself for two or three years and hoping to get away with it? Mm. But um, I think, um, anyway, the peace race was really the toughest thing I ever did. It, the year I rode it, it was from, started in Prague, went to Warsaw. I don't know if you know, but it. It, it always rotates between the three capitals of Czechoslovakia, Poland and East Germany. And that year was you know, I rode Prague, Warsaw, East Berlin. And uh, it was an experience. Previously we've talked about what people have done in their cycling career and so forth, but you've been a club man for a long time. Tell us about club life and what it's meant to you. When I started cycling I was very, uh, I think you could say, shy and not at all sure of myself, but I think that may be, it applies to a lot of people, I think if they're perfectly honest, a lot of people feel insecure and all sorts of things, they don't admit to it, but you don't know sort of what the future beholds and you know, it's like with work and all the rest of it, but um, I, as I said, when I was at um, school, they, I was introduced to cycling in a sort of very low, we were at school and these guys just, and we didn't really do a lot, but um, we were all cyclists and I rode occasionally to school and that's how it started for me, but I think my first ever cycling club was the Marlow and District Road Club, I don't quite know how I got involved, it's like a lot of things, I, I don't know how it happened, but maybe I met a cyclist one day and he just said I'm in the Marlow and you know, come along, so, and I have very fond memories of that, it was at the back of the Would You Believe a pub, <laughs> and um, it had a really nice uh, stove, you know, the old um, coal or whatever wood, and table tennis, and you went down these steps and you got a drink, and that was mostly my first, I don't know if it was my first introduction to beer, maybe not, but 
One of the members of the club was a drayman for Weatherhead, it's a big brewery in Marlow. And I always remember going to a, my first ever cycling club dinner. We all rode down there and we went on this horrible ferry. The ferries now to the Isle of Wight are quite smart, but a rough old ferry to ride or wherever. Went to the digs, went to the dinner, and I think I had my first pint of mild and bitter there, introduced by this drayman who obviously was <laughs> well um, trained in the art of beer drinking. <laughs> yeah. So that was the start of my road. To, I think most cyclists are inclined to, in, real cyclists, uh, you know, well renowned for their, uh, especially in the social season, to a few pints. And that was a very um, happy sort of period, but unfortunately national service was sort of ru ruining a lot of clubs at that time. A lot of the youngsters were going into the services and then they'd either, they'd just be away from their clubs. And unfortunately the Marlow and District Club folded. When I came out, I rode for the RAF, and then, um, which was obviously a different scene. And then I came out and I joined a local club called the Bonhomie. But I wasn't too happy with, I don't know what it was with the Bonhomie, but I did a quick change and joined the Reading Wheelers. Um, but then the problem started to occur, with, because I wanted to race at a higher level, I had to then start to sort of get involved with clubs which had a sort of like a, a sort of a hidden sort of, um, oh, what's it, sponsorship, you know, a bike dealer or somebody. Mm. And I joined the Barnet, and the reason I did that, there was a guy called Alf Hengers was in the Barnet, so there was the chance of winning sort of team prizes, and um, in fact we, were, we did win the 25 championship team twice with Hengers and a chap called John Harvey, I think. But it was the real reason for joining the barn. It was a chap called Alan Roch uh, Shorter at a bike shop, and he would give us obviously. He was a very generous guy. I mean, he only had a small shop, but he used to help us with our equipment and other dealers as well. He used to get he used to go to Whiskers, and I think I used to ride a hold to a frame. And you always sort of, and this forced me away from the local clubs, which was a, a shame in a way. And also, I never used to be able to get to the Barnet Club, so apart from we'd meet up at races. So, and then become a long period then, which is very, very sad, where I, I dropped out of club life. And then, like when I did Lands End John O'Groats, I was sponsored, or I joined the Manchester Wheelers. There was not much hope of me going out on a Manchester Wheelers club run. And in a way, it was a bit, uh, I'm not altogether happy with it, but it was the only way to further my involvement in what I was trying to do. Mm. My records I just needed backing. I and mean, of course with Moulton that would be different because that obviously was not a cycling club, that was a commercial mm. uh, thing. But um, funnily enough, it's only this year I decided to join the Maidenhead, mainly because I found some guys were going out locally and I've suddenly become involved again in the club life and yet it's, it's cycling because of my competition side of it. I've either gone out cycling on my own with one or two friends, you could say, but even then I've sort of more or less be become very remote just doing my own thing. And I work shift and that makes it difficult to go out with other people. But I've just suddenly begun, I think I said that I went out yesterday with a couple of guys and I've suddenly be got involved in club life again. And I think it's about time too also because Okay, we mentioned Tony Deadman, and uh, um, but I, I, and I'm going to the Maidenhead at AGM, and it's interesting really because the Maidenhead is was formed in 1879, and because I'm interested in cycling, I've always been interested in the, the history of cycling. You know, I often wonder what the Maidenhead would have been like, and the roads, the A4 or the Bath Road. I, I would imagine it was more or less a mud road in those days. Mm. And, uh, to go back to say that period, it would well. I'm sure you would agree. <laughs> You've been very, very interested if you could just go back for a day to see what cycling was like, because I can't believe what it was like. But it must have been, in a way, horrendous. But it was the same for everybody, wasn't it? You know, even if the Bath Road was metalled, I'm sure all the side roads were just mud and, you know, okay. and like this weather. You can imagine cycling under with all this. <laughs> I mean, it's been bad enough trying, I rode to where the other, the trees down, floods. In fact, I must show you a picture before you go, there's a lad on a bike, it's <laughs> quite funny. Do you have any regrets about what you've done in cycling, or what you haven't done? 
Oh yeah, the only regret was, and on hindsight, I don't think it is a regret, that I didn't further my, con when I rode the peace race, it was obvious I had the ability to hack it. He like Boardman in a way, brilliant rider, but he couldn't hack the sort of real, the real hard stuff like the peace. The peace race, I think, is in line. It's not so tactical as the Tour de France, but it's got a lot of the the suffering that goes on with it. I wish, in a way, I'd ridden, had a go at the Tour de France just to see how bad it really was. I think I'd have got, like most people, been slaughtered on the really big climbs, but I'm not sure really because I think you need a hell of a lot of stamina. I think. I had the sort of the staying power to last it day in and day out, mm. but the, the 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 big question mark all the time was in the 60s. It was the drug problem, I mean, and Simpson died about that time. And I mean, I suppose with the best will in the world, I think you get drawn into it because mm. the book I'm referring it was a Kimmage book. He mentions yeah. he he sort of exploded all this business about all the drugs they were taking. And he wouldn't. He refused point blank to take stuff. And I think he did want on one occasion take stuff. But I think, well, really, I don't know. I mean, I, I often wonder what would have happened if I'd have taken up the offer. I was put off for, for two reasons. A, I didn't have a lot of money myself. Whether I would have been funded enough, I don't know. I never, I never got that involved. I, I seemed to throw it, put it into touch straight away. And the other thing was, I couldn't speak the language, and that put me off. And also, I was a bit short-sighted. Now, at the time, hardly anybody seemed to ride at all in the Tour de France with glasses on. And yet, Fignon, I mean, he rode glasses, and he bloody won the bloody thing, so I don't know why I bothered about glasses. <laughs> and I could still, I thought I was worried that when riders went up the road, I wouldn't be able to tell, and things like that. I, I think I put a lot of obstacles in my way, apart mm. from the drug thing. Mm. I can't imagine what it's like. and. I think inevitably I would have been drawn into drugs mm. and um, so <coughs> therefore I haven't got any regrets really because at least I've got my health mm. and uh, I think what's life all about is being healthy at the end of the day, mm. isn't it? John, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about your cycling career, your cycling history and I've learnt a great deal about um, records and, and what's involved in, in riding and uh, I certainly appreciate it very much. Thank you very, very much for your time. It's been most enjoyable to be with you. Mm. But anyway, I've enjoyed it and I'm going to keep doing it. So Good. Whatever happens, if that lottery, uh, you know, if you, if you know the magic numbers, it's we, <laughs> we put me on trial if it's 20 million, see whether they take the 20 million or <laughs> no bite.